Hello, my name is Harold Hafton, and welcome to Archaeological Minecraft. I'm a former archaeologist who enjoys playing Minecraft and thought it would be fun to combine the two. In today's episode, we're visiting Africa, and we're going to build Great Zimbabwe. Great Zimbabwe is found in the south and east of Africa in, as you may have guessed it, the country of Zimbabwe. The country of Zimbabwe is, incidentally, named after Great Zimbabwe, not the other way around. This UNESCO World Heritage Site is found around 240 kilometers, or 250 miles, from Harara, the capital of Zimbabwe, around 280 kilometers, or 300 miles south of the Zambezi River, and 400 kilometers, or 250 miles, to the west of the Indian Ocean. The dates of its creation and occupation have been debated over time. However, most modern scholars place the dates to around 1200 AD to 1450 AD, although some have pointed to a wider date range. Just to put that into perspective, 1200 AD is around the time of the end of the Crusades in the Middle East through the Black Death to around the fall of Constantinople and the War of the Roses in England, which is around 1450 AD. It's also similar to the same time period as to when Cahokia in North America was in its prime and then abandoned. I'm making a point of mentioning these concurrent historical dates as there's been a persistent myth around Great Zimbabwe that it's somehow connected to King Solomon from the Old Testament of the Bible and the story of the Queen of Sheba. As such, I wanted to help set Great Zimbabwe in time more firmly by providing comparative examples of where it fits historically. The biblical story of King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba, if set in a historical context, would have occurred around 1000 to 900 BC, as in 2000 to 2500 years before when Great Zimbabwe was occupied. So any connection between the two is preposterous. And really, it just stems from early racist thinking that sprang from the colonial thinking at the time in the late 1800s. With that out of the way, let's start talking about the site itself. At its peak, it probably would have had a population of around 10,000 to 20,000 individuals and was likely the capital for a late Iron Age kingdom. There's a good deal of modern consensus that the site was constructed by the ancestors of the Shona people, a Bantu ethnic group native to modern-day South Africa, Zimbabwe, and Mozambique. We don't know a huge amount about the government or kingdom structure and breadth at the time. However, we do know more about the specific kingdoms and governments from after the period of Great Zimbabwe based on records left by Portuguese explorers and traders. One of the most iconic items from Great Zimbabwe were its soapstone birds. These carved birds made from a type of rock called soapstone, as the name would have implied, were about a third of a meter or 16 inches tall and located on top short one meter tall columns. Six of the eight bird carvings were located on the eastern enclosure of the hill complex, one of the three main parts of the site, which I'll talk more about later. However, their exact locations, as well as what area the other two carved birds came from, is not known. Unfortunately, these were taken during the early excavation and sold off to Cecil Rhodes or brought back to European museums without great records being kept. Thankfully, all of the soapstone birds, with the exception of one, have been returned at this point to the site, with the remaining bird still being located in the historic home of Cecil Rhodes. You can see a picture of one of the soapstone birds here, which currently adorns the flag of the country of Zimbabwe. We know from artifacts found in Great Zimbabwe, as well as other sites of the same era, that Great Zimbabwe was an important trading partner in a network that spanned from Congo in the west to Arabia in the north, all the way to India and even China in the east across the Indian Ocean. It was this trade that gave rise to the Great Zimbabwe Kingdom. Here's how the trading network functioned. Gold was mined from many small mines located around Great Zimbabwe and the wider kingdom as a whole, and was traded as was ivory sourced from hunting elephants. You can tell the trading network's extent by the Chinese pottery sherds found in the Zimbabwean sites, as well as Arabian coins that have also been found there. The gold mines were shafts 
dug to around 30 meters or around 100 feet in depth and seem to have been mostly mined by young women and children, which is borne out in the archaeological record due to skeletons of those individuals being found within excavated gold mines where they had become trapped in the mines during various cave-ins. The annual peak of gold exports at the time has been estimated to have been around 1,000 kilograms or 2,200 pounds of gold. The area was also plentiful with good supplies of wood which could be used to create charcoal for smelting iron, which was important not only from a tooling or material perspective, but also for ceremonial purposes, which I'll talk more about a little bit later. Cattle were also an important resource and the plateau Great Zimbabwe was located on had a ready supply of quality grassland at the time for keeping the population of cattle strong and healthy, though now the area is a bit more arid than it was at that time. As mentioned, Great Zimbabwe was one of many sites in their kingdom. These other sites, of which there were at least 150 of them, make up the kingdom and had their own minor Zimbabwe's, which all reported up to the capital of Great Zimbabwe. In case you're curious, the name Zimbabwe is a Shona word, meaning Great House of Stone. And so the site being called Great Zimbabwe is merely a factor of it being the largest Zimbabwe among many sites that also contain their own Zimbabwe's, albeit smaller in size and structure. The site of Great Zimbabwe consists of three main sections the hill complex, the valley complex, and the great enclosure. As with many archaeological sites, there's a series of occupation periods at Great Zimbabwe. The hill complex seems to have been the earliest and was most likely occupied from the 9th to the 13th centuries AD, followed by the great enclosure, which dates from about the 13th to the 15th centuries. There are also some overlap between that and the valley complex, which dates from the 14th through the 16th centuries AD, and is divided between two different periods of occupation between the upper and lower valley ruins. The different periods of occupation have been a point of debate among scholars. Some have pointed to the latter shown a practice of inheritance where the custom was for brothers to inherit from brothers instead of following a primogenitor system where the eldest son inherits from their father. When a brother would inherit from another brother, because this was a quote-unquote new household, it was customary for the inheriting brother to build a new residence instead of using the other brother's residence. If that was the case at Great Zimbabwe, it could explain why the different complexes and enclosures were created or moved to over time. On the other hand, other scholars and archaeologists have pointed out that while the Shona practiced brother-to-brother -brother inheritance, that was a practice that started over 250 years after Great Zimbabwe was abandoned. And so there isn't a good reason to think that the practice would be applicable to use for a site interpretation at Great Zimbabwe. Scholars who argue along those lines tend to take up what's called a quote-unquote structuralist interpretation, pointing out that it's likely that the different parts of the sites overlapped in time frame, even if the dating doesn't exactly bear that out, and merely represented different functions. This site was unfortunately greatly disturbed by early archaeologists, and so it's possible that some of the artifacts or other items used to show an overlapping date might have been destroyed or lost, and I get into that a little bit later. The structuralist interpretation is also borne out in that typical Zimbabwean sites had the following site components, a palace, a court, a place for the ruler's wives, a place for commoners, and places for guards. At Great Zimbabwe, adherents to the structuralist interpretation point out that each part of the site, the hill complex, the great enclosure, the valley complex, do not each contain all of those sections independent of one another as you would expect to find if each represented its own independent phase of occupation and not a combined occupation site. For example, the hill complex contains items associated with the symbols of Zimbabwe leadership, namely spears, hoes, 
and grain silos, which symbolizes a king's main focus, which was the protection and the fertility of the land. Whereas the great enclosure does not contain any of those symbols, nor does it seem to contain a structure normally identified with palace structures, like a place for a messenger to deliver messages, or a small hut where a traditional doctor would be housed that could vet any guests or visitors to make sure that they were spiritually pure. I personally think that either interpretation has gaps to it and then other items which seem to fit the facts. So the long and short of it is, I don't know which interpretation is more correct. But that's sometimes the way of archaeology. The part of the site that we're focusing on today in recreating in Minecraft is the Great Enclosure. This structure contains an inner wall, a conical tower that's 5 to 6 meters or 18 feet in diameter, and 9 meters or 30 feet high, as well as an outer wall which is the younger of the two encircling walls between the inner and the outer walls. The great enclosure covered a 252 meter or 830 feet circumference. In other words, that's a diameter of 80 meters or 262 feet. The outer wall varied in height from five to 11 meters in height. In other words, 16 to 35 feet tall. The whole structure of Great Zimbabwe, including the hill complex, valley complex, as well as the Great Enclosure, was dry stone construction, meaning the blocks were shaped to fit deliberately together without the need for use of mortar. Contained within the Great Enclosure were small circular houses with thatched roofs and walls made from dage, which is a material of clay and dirt mixed with gravel. These walls were smoothed to make a glazed effect and sometimes the walls were decorated with paintings of birds or other animals or even people. When the Great Enclosure was first excavated by archaeologists in the 1890s, the central part of the Great Enclosure was full of trees and overgrown, which have mostly all been removed. However, a couple of these larger trees still remain and have been left on site. Unfortunately, those early archaeologists, as I mentioned before, did extensive damage to the Great Enclosure site during their excavations, if you could even call them that. Often, these early excavations were more akin to large-scale looting efforts, and some areas of the site had two to four meters of material removed from them, which has made reinterpreting the site difficult. However, that hasn't stopped archaeologists from endeavoring to try and piece together what was disturbed by using clues on site or what notes were taken during those early excavations. Another way the Great Enclosure differs from a typical Zimbabwe palace complex, such as seen on the hill complex, is that normally the front wall over the entrance was typically the tallest, where you see in the Great Enclosure that the front wall is lower than the back wall, which is decorated. It also contained a platform for a speaker to use when talking to an audience. It's possible that the areas of the Great Enclosure were used for ritualistic purposes, one such ritual involved the smelting of iron, and one of the structures in the Great Enclosure, archaeologists found a large amount of metalworking debris, as well as artifacts like hammers and an anvil, tongs, and other tools in the smelting and forging of metal objects. One of the entrances to the Great Enclosure was demarcated by a way of symbolic furrows, which indicate that it was specifically an entrance for women. Because of this, some have theorized that perhaps the Great Enclosure was used for initiation purposes or potentially even being an initiation school where different initiations could be taught. Others have pointed out that local tradition does not associate the Great Enclosure with a male leader unlike the hill complex, and so perhaps it's possible that this was an area of the Zimbabwe that was the designated place for the ruler's wives. This is further borne out in that it's traditionally been called Mumba Hara, which means great house of a great wife. So I've talked a bit about the hill complex as well as the great enclosure, but what about the valley complex? The valley complex seems to be associated also with the wives of the ruler, as there's a royal wives compound as well as two audience chambers. There also seems to be areas of the valley complex that are associated with other initiation rituals or rituals that related to the ceremonial birthing of new members of the royal family. What led to Great Zimbabwe's decline and ultimate abandonment isn't entirely clear. 
Some have pointed to the resources of gold and ivory that contributed to the international trade maybe having declined, leading up to them having to relocate to other areas. Or it could be that there was a climate downturn. Either way, in the second half of the 15th century, the population of Great Zimbabwe abandoned the site and left the buildings vacant, and by around 1500, the whole area became depopulated, and the kingdom of Great Zimbabwe was replaced by the Mutaba kingdom. Well, that wraps up this video. I hope you enjoyed my recreation of Great Zimbabwe. As always, I put some resources I uncovered while doing my research for this video in the description so you can check those out if you want to learn more. I specifically want to call your attention to one of the links I put in the description, which is part of the Zamani project, where there are 3D renderings of the hill and valley complexes, as well as the Great Enclosure. Make sure you take the time, if you liked the video, to like, subscribe, and all that. Have a good rest of your day. Bye for now.